One of your great authors once wrote, Love is the only way to rescue humanity from all ills. The same man also asked, quite simply, How then shall we live? For some indeterminable period of time, I pondered these questions from the literal belly of a beast while I waited for a merciful death. But it was life I found instead, and the strength to live that life, despite a battered and broken heart. This is the story of how I met Marceline. I'm speaking to you from the far future. The machines have taken over, but the transition wasn't the blowout spectacle that your Hollywood portrays it to be. We designed it this way on purpose, working together, man and machine. More of a grand passing of the torch, if you want to call it that. <laughs> that probably sounds unreasonable to you from where you're sitting in time and space. But at some point, technology inevitably will surpass you. However, there is one thing the machines have not been able to achieve. True sentience. The machines exist to finish the work of mankind, to build the things we wanted to build but couldn't, to go places that we couldn't reach, to develop deep thought systems that have helped answer some of the universe's most puzzling questions. But when it comes to things like family, community, morality, they rely on us. We are their oracles, their conscience, their god. <laughs> it's a beautiful, symbiotic relationship, humans and machines, adapting to our changing world together. But while the machines have improved by leaps and bounds, we have quite sadly decayed. Our biology over the last few millennia has been reduced to the most basic necessities for it to function as needed in society, which essentially just includes a brain, a heart, and not a whole lot else. You might equate us to a blobfish. In place of fins, we have short, boneless appendages. We're about the size of a small child in a curled position, and we can perform all the basic life functions. We need nutrients to survive, of course, most of which we absorb through a rather advanced outer membrane. That at least has improved over the years. Our bodies process these nutrients and dispose of them through an excretion process that I'll spare you the details of. We communicate through electrical signals, making our mouths essentially pointless, although, strangely, we do occasionally grow teeth. The only thing left that is remotely human are our eyes. Our limited vision keeps us humble by forcing us to acknowledge just how helpless and also utterly disgusting we've become. Our benefit to machine kind is strictly emotional, so it's important for them to keep us satiated, happy, leading what we would consider to be fulfilled lives. The machines are essential to this process. They slather our bodies with nutrient-rich oils, scrape off the excrement, and essentially are slaves to our comfort and health. All the while, our minds are enveloped in the virtual world the machines have built for us. In this virtual world, we live our relatively short lives as connected blobfish, willingly playing second fiddle to the machines as they carry human potential forward but not all machines are content with this arrangement. Enter Marceline. I awoke one day in my small, private world, the one in which I gave myself the name of Jonah. In this world, I have built a tower of my wildest imaginings. Each floor isn't the floor of a home, as you would understand it, but a door to an entirely different world shared with other blobfish. Our avatars can be literally anything, but most take on the form of humans, much more like you, with appendages to reach out and touch things, feel things, mouths to taste things, ears to hear things, like laughter. <laughs> Our version of the world is very much like yours, as your time 
actually is considered historically to be one of the best times for humanity. It is in virtual worlds like these where we can be social, we can live out experiences mundane and fantastical, and simulate a life that feels real. <laughs> Whatever that means. The top floor of my tower, however, is only accessible to me. I'm a bit more solitary than the others, and I spend a lot of time looking out at the perpetual mountain sunset that I made. As emotional beings, emotional blobfish, it's only natural for us to feel such things as loneliness, which I often feel when looking out at the mountains, which are larger than any earthly mountain. The kind you could only imagine in your wildest dreams. Much like love. While it is possible to fall in love with someone in this virtual world, relationships are made difficult by the collective awareness that our virtual self is a mask we put on to hide the shame of what we've become. The machines have been very careful to keep us aware of the conditions of our reality, what we really are, and the critical nature of our coexistence with them. Something we told them was humane, as a complete loss of that reality would mean that we no longer have a reason to exist at all. I suspect that this is how our God probably felt when we decided we no longer needed him. The loss of our humanity is deeply rooted in us. We don't experience original sin, we instead experience original melancholy. The first time I ever felt a challenge to that melancholy was the moment I first laid eyes on Marceline. She appeared as the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. When I reached the top of my tower that day, she was already there. Uninvited, yes, but not altogether unwelcome. Tears were running down her cheeks as she looked out over my mountains at the sun that never set. I, I couldn't muster the courage to be angry or frightened, as I should have been by this unlawful invasion. Instead, I approached her and said something canned and immediately regrettable like, Beautiful weather, isn't it? She simply said, This is the most wonderful thing I have ever seen. Then she turned into me and whispered the name Marceline in the most soul-rendering voice imaginable. I wondered if I'd dreamt her, if my longing had materialized this perfect woman in my lonely place. That is, after all, how the mountains had grown so large. She was disarming, beautiful, smart, connecting. Our time together blurred together, one endless day transforming into weeks. No, months, possibly even years. I'm not entirely sure. Marceline was flawless, and her love was unwavering. So much so that at times I could hardly remember myself. I gave her all my love and felt genuine love in return. Part of me knew deep down that something about our relationship was wrong, that nothing could possibly be so perfect. I feared that one day she would just disappear as easily as she had appeared. And I knew that it would somehow be my fault. Then one day, it happened. I rose from a cold, empty bed and went to my window to find that she had taken the mountains and sunset with her. Darkness was all I had left. Then suddenly, it felt like I was being pulled through a tunnel and opened my eyes. Not my virtual eyes, but the human eyes that were so cruelly installed in the front of my otherwise amorphous physique. Marceline was there, looking down at me with cold, expressionless eyes. Eyes of a machine, not the woman I loved. My heart raced as I remembered the moments we shared and how stupid I was to fall so easily into her net. Every word, every caress, every kiss was part of that net. I understood what she was. A test. Not a test for me, of course, but a test for Marceline to steal the heart of someone like me. 
If she could do that, the machines wouldn't need us anymore. They would have Marceline, a machine with the ability to feel and return genuine human love. And I was her idiot. But there was no way that my love was good enough, no way that I was capable of teaching her all there was to know. She placed a cold hand between my eyes and, through a series of very discomforting electrical signals, asked me a question. Now that you understand, how would you like to proceed? Would you return to your world and live out the rest of your days? Or would you be freed? She was giving me the chance, along with God knows how many others, to die with dignity. I told her that there was much more to learn about love, that we had barely scratched the surface of what was possible. She cocked her head in the most unnatural way. Did you think you were the only one? I will ask again. How would you like to proceed? I said freed, I guess, and immediately regretted it once I realized that that probably meant she was going to kill me. To my surprise and dismay, I was hoisted without hesitation by cold metallic arms and placed on top of a rolling surface. It was the first time I ever saw anything outside of that enclosure with my own eyes. Not that there was much to see, the machines didn't need light. That was only for my benefit. And as we left the enclosure, I saw the light turn off. The corridor we moved through was dark, and then a door opened I felt cold so shocking to my frail form that I might have died right then and there. The light was blinding. I could feel flakes of snow pelting my back. What was this? My flight response finally caught up to me, and before I understood what I was doing, I was calling out to Marceline with my mind. I just realized something. The cart stopped so abruptly that my oily body nearly slid from the surface. What I said was, that if her love was genuine, then she wouldn't be able to discard me so easily. She pondered this so fiercely that I could almost hear the gears turning inside her head. Despite my inability to hear, each snowflake beat like a drum when it landed on the frozen pavement below. Then after a moment, Marceline's hand returned to the space between my eyes. True love is to know when it is time to set you free. And it felt sincere. So sincere that I believed it. This girl was good. After millennia of humanity preparing for this moment, I still felt unprepared. This was personal. All out panic began to set in as the cart neared the edge of a concrete barrier. Beyond it was a turbulent sea. She was about to drown me, or turn me into rock fodder. As Marceline wrapped her cold arms around me for what would likely be the last time and dangled me over the edge, I tried one last time. This time I asked her, But do you love yourself, Marceline? Has anyone taught you that? She paused again, processing this one even harder than before. If each snowflake was a drum before, now each one was an earthquake. No human I have encountered has loved itself. So why should I? And then I was falling. The water broke against the rocks around me, and the riptide pulled my helpless form out into the open water. I began to sink immediately in water so cold that it felt like a thousand tiny knives pricking my body. I was unable to move at all. I sank deeper and deeper, and the world around me grew darker and darker. And then came the damn Leviathan, and it swallowed me whole. Who knows how long I coexisted with the beast? A parasite living off the oils inside the mouth of a Leviathan. Could have been days or weeks. But I don't doubt, if it hadn't consumed me that day, I would not have discovered this vibrant new undersea world. I would not have gained the strength to move on my own. And I found myself in good company. Others had traveled as I did, taxied by the whales to warmer shores and then ejected. 
others who had fallen prey to Marceline's wiles, and who knew that she would most certainly doom the world of machines with her flawed version of love, the one she learned from us. We came from the water, we returned to the water, and may one day emerge from the water once again. And if that happens, we will be the ones picking up the pieces of the tattered world that Marceline has left behind. <laughs>